If you would join me this morning in Mark chapter 8. this on? You join me in verse 31. And he began to teach them, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this Plainly, There was no hesitation. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he, that is Jesus, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. What are the things of God? Jesus now expounds on that. In calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and for forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pause to pray because we are in such need of your power, triune God. We need your power to deliver us from familiarity with this text. We need your power today to, to see the, the value of a human soul. We need your power today to be more mindful of the great exchange of Christ and his righteousness for our sins. We need your power today to understand, to be committed afresh to live as Christians with the mind of Christ, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow you. Please, Holy Spirit, we know you have come to, not to glorify yourself, but to glorify Jesus. Would you do that in our midst today? Would you please paint before our, the eyes of our heart today the glory of our Savior? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus the Christ? What are the demands to follow Christ? What are the fundamental characteristics of the Christian? I'm not asking the all-important question, how does one become a Christian? The answer to that, and that question is the most important, the answer to that is repenting of our sins and embracing what Jesus Christ did through his death, burial, and resurrection. But when a person does that, when a person is converted, then they experience a new birth. And when that happens, something fundamental changes in their life. The gospel, becoming a Christian, 
results in a new mind, the kind of mind that Jesus describes in the passage before us. If you remember from last week when we saw this passage that Jesus reveals to his disciples, as we just read, that he, the Son of Man, he is going to suffer many things, he's going to be rejected by the elders, and he's going to be killed and then rise again. The disciples all had the same response, but Peter is the spokesman, and he takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. Because Peter and the disciples and the culture of the Jews just could not imagine a suffering Messiah. They could not imagine a Messiah who would come and be killed. They expected a Messiah who would come and would conquer. And so Peter thought that the words of Jesus were preposterous. And maybe even Peter is saying that the chief priests and the elders and the scribes might desire to do that. But I'm going to make sure it doesn't happen. And Jesus doesn't thank Peter for his concern. He rebukes him and calls him, he says to him, get behind me, Satan. And what he was saying is your behavior is satanic. Actually, your, your thinking is satanic. He says, you're not thinking you haven't set your mind on the things of God, verse 33, but on the things of man. Peter has forgotten that he is a disciple. He's forgotten those words in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, where Jesus said, Follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men, make you fishers of men. And so he's now gotten out in front of the Lord, and he's kind of discipling the Lord. And so the Lord says, Get behind me. By the way, it's not the last time that Jesus is going to say to Peter, Follow me. In John 21, after when he restores him, and then he tells him about John, and, 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 and Peter's all concerned about what's going to happen to John. And he says, don't worry about him, you what? Follow me. In fact, he says, follow me twice within three verses to Peter. Peter's thinking at this point was skewed. He had a wrong view of why Messiah was coming. If Peter and the disciples had, had a cursory uh, reading of the Old Testament, they would understood that yes, Messiah was coming to conquer, but first of all, he would have to suffer. We looked at this last week, we touched on this in Isaiah 53, he makes it very clear that Jesus Christ, Messiah, would come and he would suffer for the transgressions of his people, which in their context would be the Jews. Malachi wrote in chapter 3 that um, the Israel will be looking forward to the messenger who will come to his temple, speaking of Messiah. And they're, and, and, and they're crying out for that. They're saying, we want mes the messenger to come. And Malachi says, are you sure you re really want him to come? Because when he comes, he's not going to be sorting out your enemies. He's going to be sorting you out. Peter and the disciples saw themselves as the goodies and the Romans as the baddies. And so therefore, they couldn't imagine why Messiah would come to suffer. They'd miss the point of his coming. He was coming, first of all, to deliver them from the bondage of their sins. And only then would there, would there be any concern about really, uh, uh, delivering them from the bondage of Rome, political bondage. The Lord says, your thinking is not straight. You're not thinking the thoughts of God. You are thinking the thoughts of man. And then in the next passage, the one we're going to, at least we're just going to begin today. In this passage, Jesus now further instructs them and helps them to understand the difference between God's thinking and man's thinking. He calls the crowd to him and begins to tell them what it's going to cost them if they're going to follow him. It's going to, it's going to require they have a mind shift. It's going to require that they have a, the mind of Christ. And in this passage, we see that there are three characteristics of the mind of Christ. The mind of the Christian. And by the way, for every Christian. And they're this. First of all, there's a mind that is willing to suffer humiliation. We see that in verse 34. We will also look this morning, God willing, at verses 35 to part of verse 38. That the mind of a Christian is the mind that has an ongoing serious calculation about what is important. And then the next time we're in Mark, we will look at the mind of the Christian has an assurance of eventual sovereign vindication. I want to take these first two points apart this morning for our benefit. 
If you join me in verse 34, Jesus, in calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In a nutshell, what Jesus is saying is this, that if you are going to follow me, then you are going to suffer. If you're going to follow me, then you are going to suffer. He has said, he started this whole discussion by telling them in verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. And now, after rebuking Peter and the disciples by extension, he says to them, along with the crowd, understand that if you are going to follow me, if you're going to come after me, understand what's expected. Understand that because I suffer, you also are going to suffer. Now, it's interesting that he calls the crowd to him, not just the disciples. He's had this private conversation with the disciples and, and rebuked all of them for having a mind not set in the things of God, but on the things of man. And now he calls the crowd to him with the disciples. And I think Jesus did that because Jesus is making a point here that it's not just for these special 12 that they are to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow. It's not just for these 12 that will suffer, but any and all who follow him are going to suffer. He's saying to everybody who will hear him, I have come for you, but if you follow me, then you are signing up for suffering. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to suffer. I was speaking to a pastor friend of mine some months ago, and he said in the month of December, he was laid on his back all month. He was sick. And he said he wasn't able to preach that whole month, and he said as he was uh, convalescing, he began just to examine his life. And he said, I realized, looking over the past year, he said, he said I, I realized that I, I seen throughout the whole year to be set on just avoiding suffering. He said, because I don't like to suffer. And I said to him, oh, I do. No, I didn't say that. Nobody likes to suffer. And we had a very honest discussion about the fact that when you're serving the Lord, there's a lot of suffering, and we don't like that. We don't like the heartache. We don't like the betrayal. We don't like the discouragements. We don't like the failures. We don't like to suffer. But Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you are signing up for suffering. He's saying to them, count the cost. I remember reading Philip Schaff's History of the Christian Church years ago. I was going to read it in a year. It's an eight-volume set. And it was one of the, most, the richest things I ever did from, from my own heart. I remember reading, I never, understood, never knew this until I read his history of the Christian church, that in the, the early century, first century of the, of the church, you had people obsessed with becoming martyrs. And it actually became a matter of pride. And they wanted to be martyrs because they thought by being a martyr that that would give them a more glorious resurrection and a better place in the kingdom. It almost became a pride thing, how much you could suffer. So that there can be a, a wrong kind of signing up for that. And Jesus isn't exhorting us to do that. But he is saying, listen, if you follow me, understand you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer humiliation. Remember when Paul wrote about this decades after, after these events. And he wrote and he said in Philippians, he says, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. What was the mind of, of, of Christ Jesus? That though he was God, he did not see it as something to be grasped. He was, he was God. He had all the right to be worshipped. He, he had all the right to be adored. And yet what did he do? He humbled himself. Took upon himself the form of a servant. Was made as a human being. And because of that, he became obedient unto death, the death of the cross. He suffered humiliation, and his humiliation led to suffering. If we're going to follow Jesus Christ, there is going to be plenty of suffering. Martin Luther wrote a tremendous um, thesis on what he called the third theology of the, of the cross versus the theology of glory. I remember reading that years ago and being struck by it. 
And he said that the, the theology of glory says this, that if you follow Jesus Christ, everything is going to go your way. The theology of glory looks for all these messianic blessings in the here and now. And so all the blessings of health and wealth and prosperity, does that sound familiar? He wrote that 500 years ago. He said there's a theology of glory and that's what so many Christians are living for is glory now. He says but the theology of the cross is a theology of suffering. That we are going to have a crown, but first of all, there's a cross. We are going to have exaltation, but first of all, there's going to be suffering. And Jesus describes this with three terms here. This suffering is going to include, first of all, denying ourselves. And can I say this before we begin to expound that? That it's very important for us to understand that Jesus is not describing here different kinds of Christians. That is why it's so important to understand that when he talks to the disciples who people would see in the church as, as, in fact, as the original readers of this, the Roman Christians would read this some 30 years after the events. As they would read this gospel, they might be tempted to think that these were super saints. I mean, these are apostles. And so, yes, we understand that they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow, but I'm only a part of the crowd. I'm only, one, I'm only a Christian. I'm only a believer. I'm, a, I'm an average Christian. No, no, no. Jesus says, disciples, you, they're going to be apostles. You're going to suffer, and so are the crowd. There's not two levels there's not two different kinds of Christians. You're either a disciple of Jesus Christ or you are not a believer in Jesus Christ. And so all of us, this is not for different tiers of Christians. This is true for all of us. And every one of us who is a Christian will have a mind to deny himself. We will not always live that out perfectly, but we will, first of all, deny ourselves. There will be self-denial. The word deny means to, it's a strong word. It means to deny utterly. It means to disown. It means to abstain. It, it has the idea of forgetting oneself, of losing sight of oneself and of one's own interest. When Jesus said to this crowd, if you're going to follow me, you need to have God's thinking. And God's thinking is, if you follow me, you, have, you will deny yourself. That was very countercultural then. It's very countercultural now. I remember being in India a couple years ago and billboard after bill, billboard in different parts of India where I was was advertising Samsung. And this is not an advert for them. Although I do have one. And these adverts for Samsung, every one of these billboards was, it takes a great selfie. Think about this. Think about 30 years ago before we had cell phones. Can you think that far, that far back? <laughs> Remember Brian Houston gave me my first cell phone, had a big antenna on it. 30 years ago, somebody takes a picture of themselves, of themselves. They then blow it up, they make about 100 posters, they go around the neighborhood and they just put them in different yards. What would you say about that person? You'd say narcissist, right? Or, or, or running for election, maybe, all right? I don't mean that, all right? I don't mean that at all, right? But we would say, that's absurd. Who would do that? We do that all the time now. It's all about promoting self. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you must deny yourself. He wasn't suggesting that we loathe ourselves. What he's saying is simply this. Those who follow me, they abandon self-promotion. They abandon self-promotion and they give up their agenda for Jesus' agenda. They give their agenda for Jesus' agenda. Jesus, again, um, exemplified that. He had the agenda. He was God. He is God. And he gave up the right to exercise all those attributes in order to become a man. Why? Because that was the Father's agenda. 
So I think that Jesus was so upset here with Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, because Jesus Christ loved God the Father. And God the Father had said to his son, you go for me. I will give you a people and you die for them. And they will bring honor and glory to me in Jesus, God the Son. So love the Father, he said, I will do that. And so he came with that mindset. And Jesus was disturbed that Peter and the disciples would want to get in the way of the Father's agenda. When we follow Jesus Christ, we are signing on to his agenda. We're not promoting ourselves. If we truly are his followers, then we're going to be characterized by a rejection of self-promotion and an embracing of self-abandonment for the higher purpose of God's glory. I received an email along with some other pastors this week from a man in the United States. I don't know this man, but he's a pastor and has a young family. And he said that they have a son who is a really good soccer player. And he said, they're just looking for some counsel. He said, because our son's getting ready, we're ready to move him from uh, one level of playing to a more competitive level of playing. And he said that that's going to mean playing games on a Sunday. And so this, this brother very honestly said, I'd just like to have any feedback from anybody who has certain, any thoughts about this. And so I share with him my thoughts about that. And I don't know what this brother's decision is going to be, but I appreciate the fact he's asking the question. Because what he's saying is, we want to raise our family to follow Christ, and so we want to make sure that we're on his agenda. Do you have any help to offer on this? When we, when we follow Jesus Christ, we're denying ourselves. That means we're giving up some comforts. That means we're giving up our own agenda. We're going to put the interest of God's kingdom and God's name and God's will above our own agenda. It means we're committed to not being controlled by the desire for comfort, but rather the desire for conformity to Christ. It means where you live, perhaps, self-denial might look like missing out on a career advancement because you're seeking God's kingdom advancement above that. I have a good friend in the States who's very high up in a major multinational company. And years ago, he made the decision and informed his, his, his pastor and the elders that he was not going to take any more promotions. And that they were going to, he, he, said, he said, we're very comfortable where we're living. In fact, we have too much and we're, going to, and, and we're not going to take any more promotions. He said, because I want to give more time to serving in the church. And by the way, interesting side bit to that. Um, they accepted that. Uh, the company, and they, and they kept laterally moving him to departments, and every department that he went to became very successful, and they wanted to promote him again. And he'd say no, because he said, I want to give my time. I remember I had a good friend, Grant Hoyland, at Hillbrow Baptist Church. And Grant was a lawyer here in Johannesburg for a major law firm, and, and, and Grant was a, a, a godly man who loved the gospel. He loved souls of people. He loved the church. And he said to his uh, partners one day, he said, I, 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 can, I, I really only want to work like two days a week just to support myself and get the rest of my time to the church. And they said, well, we, we, we've never done that before and you're going to have to leave. And he said, okay, here's a resignation. A week later, they said, come back. And that brother, he wasn't interested in making a whole lot more money. He said, I want to invest my time serving. Self-denial. It's going to look different in different people's lives. These are not, the illustrations I give are not mandates for all of us. But there are illustrations of people who are denying self because they're promoting the agenda of God. Self-denial looks like a, lo a local church being willing to suffer scorn because of its faithful adherence to the word of God. I mean, we want to be, I, I, I want to be well-liked, don't you? I like to be popular in the community, but there are certain things that we preach that are going to make us very unpopular. In fact, increasingly so in, in our country, it's going to actually put us in a position of, of, of perhaps even facing arrest because of the things that we are preaching. But we have to deny self and say, we're, our Savior has given his life for us. And I'm a follower of him, and therefore, we're going to deny ourselves. Secondly, Jesus said, you must take up your cross. That's if, if the first one, denying self, speaks of self-denial, this is self-sacrifice. Take up your cross. 
It's interesting that Jesus said, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected, and then he says, and be killed. Now that was just too much for them, because the Messiah being killed, that was, that was preposterous. But now he begins to give them a hint of how that killing is going to take place. And he says, because he's saying that if I'm your master and I'm going to suffer, you, my followers, are going to suffer, right? Right? He's talking about being killed, now he talks about them taking up a cross. We're familiar with cross, so it doesn't perhaps strike us as it would these disciples. When they heard that, and they're identifying Messiah crucified, and we crucified? The cross was a horrific way to die. The Assyrians, I think it was, were the ones who invented crucifixion, and someone said the Romans perfected it. Crucifixion was an, uh, was an extreme instrument of cruelty and pain, dehumanization and shame. It symbolized the hated Roman oppression. We'll see later on in Mark when Jesus collapses under the weight of the cross and that man from Libya is asked to carry the cross, told to carry the cross. That would have been a terrible thing for that man because anybody that carried a cross would have been completely humiliated before everyone. Because if you had a cross on your back, people, people were looking at you and identifying you as the worst of the worst. The scum of the scum. The worst of criminals. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, it's not only self-denial, but it's self-sacrifice. Jesus Christ, again, Philippians 2, he becomes obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus is saying, look guys, if you follow me, and I want you to, and he's going to get to that in a moment, I want you to, but understand, it's going to mean great, great sacrifice. What he's saying to the disciples, and sometimes we have so domesticated this passage, we, we, we lose sight of this. These disciples heard this. They heard Jesus saying, if you follow me, you're going to die. Physically. In fact, all the disciples, except for one, were martyred. They heard, if you follow me, you're going to die. You're going to lose your life. You're going to be killed. I was reading this week, biography of Martin Luther, and talked about the fact of those who were martyred because they preached the gospel. And he talked about a young man who, uh, a pastor who had been faithful to the gospel and he was still within the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, they all were in a sense at that time. And the, the local archbishop uh, set things up in such a way that as this man was traveling from one town to another, he was assassinated. He was put to death. Put to death not by the world, but put to death by the church. Throughout church history, in fact, we'll see this more later on, if not today, next week, that throughout church history, sometimes the biggest enemies of the church have arisen from within. We sang the Reformation hymn just now, glorious hymn. But people actually spilled their blood for those truths. People today still spilling, spilling their blood for those truths. There's been lots of bloodshed of the church in Eritrea and Ethiopia over the past 50 years. Most of that has come from an Orthodox church against the Evangelical church. It happens. Still happening today around the world, believers suffering. Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, you're going to die. I'm grateful that we live in a country where right now that is not a threat. But we do need to realize that Jesus wasn't just speaking here hyperbolically. He wasn't just speaking metaphorically. He was saying, if you're going to follow me, you may very well die. We're praying for Ecuador this week. You know, Ecuador is a place where Jim Elliott and his fellow uh, missionaries were martyred. They followed Jesus. They denied self. They were no longer concerned about protecting their own agenda. They were abandoning self-preservation and they lost their lives for Christ's sake. For you and I, what does that look like? Again, I want to keep before us the fact that we need to realize that we might indeed have to lay down our life one day for the gospel. I have a brother-in-law who was a Navy SEAL for many years. And when I was in the States recently and 
he doesn't like to talk much about it, but we were together and I just said, Butch, I said, I had some questions about the Navy SEALs and he was sharing some stories. He talked about once they were sent into Cambodia to rescue a missionary family and they didn't get there in time. The missionary family had been killed. Just in the last 20 years, missionaries were rescued by the Navy SEALs in the, in the Philippine Islands. The fact of the matter is people die today because they're following Christ. And even though we may never be in that position, we need to read this and realize if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you give Him your all. We abandon our self-promotion, self-denial. We abandon self-preservation. We're not interested in defending ourselves. If you take up your cross, what he's saying is you're going to be executed. It's a picture of death. And Paul builds on this in Romans 6, a glorious passage. We've been crucified with Christ, and that means we're dead to sin. But, and that's glorious, but there's even more to it than that. You know, nobody ever set up a fast food restaurant or any kind of restaurant in the middle of a cemetery. Because there's no appetite. And when we realize we've taken up a cross and, and we die to self, that, that should put a stake right through so many of our sinful appetites. But more so than that, or in addition to that, dead people don't defend themselves. I don't know about you, but I like to defend myself. I, I try to run five or six days a week, and many times when I've run, I've carried on a court case as I've run. I've carried people with me, and I've had this court case and the lawyer within me has won. And I've defended myself against people. I've defended myself against accusations. I like to defend myself. But when I come face to face with this qualification that I am to take up my cross, then I realize I am dead and dead people stop being defensive. Dead men and women are not worried about the future. Dead men and women are not obsessed with food and drink and sex. Jesus said, when you follow me, you put a stake through that. You die to that. No more self-preservation. I read this week of a man in the state of Tennessee in America that was executed. In America, they do that by um, lethal injection. And it's always been a custom when someone is executed, at least in America, that they let you choose your last meal. And they give you $20, at least in Tennessee, $20 towards whatever meal you want. And this man who had become a Christian as he sat on death row, he said, I don't want my last meal. He said, I would rather you take that $20 and go find a homeless person and feed them. And a lot of people heard about that and hundreds and thousands of dollars were given to help feed the homeless in that area. But as I read that, I thought, what a great illustration of what execution does. This man said, you know what? I'm dead. I'm a dead man walking. And therefore, this meal is irrelevant. Help somebody else. When we take up our cross, we are no longer living for ourselves. We're not preserving ourselves. We are living for Christ and for others. If we're going to live this out, we live this out in our family, we live this out in our school, we live this out in the workplace, and we live, we work the, we live this out in the church. I mean, Paul, after talking about the glorious gospel for 11 chapters in Romans, comes to chapter 12 and says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, in light of this gospel, in light of who Christ is, in light of the fact that you're following him, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies as a what? Living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And after six verses of exhorting that, he then, or five verses, he, 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 in verse 60, he, he, he now says, here's how you live out that living sacrifice. In the church, you serve one another. If we deny ourselves, we take up our cross, then we are using the gifts God gives to us 
to serve one another in the church. The church corporately must take up its cross and, and follow. We have to be willing to be scorned by the world and even scorned by those sometimes within the church because of a faithfulness to proclaim the full gospel. I was thinking about this the other day. Many of you who have been here, many of you old timers with me, will remember the days when there was a controversy because I was preaching then exactly what I'm preaching this morning. That if you follow Jesus Christ, there's a cost. That there's not two tiers, believers and disciples. If you're a believer, you're a disciple. And the cost is the same. And there was someone who thought I was teaching heresy, teaching work salvation. They called it Lordship Salvation. And he wrote a book. And some years later, he, uh, he wrote this book. And, and he sent me an email. And he said, I've written this book. And he said, I just thought in all, all, all fairness, I need to let you know that I've mentioned you in this book. He said, I've said, and he, and he, and he, and he, he, he said in the book, I have said that you're the one who brought in this heresy to South Africa. And I thought, well, I didn't know I was that important. And, 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 and I thought it was very cheeky, by the way. He sent me a, a link. He said, if you want to read about it, you can buy my book. <laughs> Even those within the church are confused about what it means to follow Jesus. But we can't compromise on this. I didn't write this. Jesus said this. That if anyone's going to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Anyone. Crowd or super saint. All of us, the cost is the same. Jonathan Edwards, after 23 years of faithful ministry in his church, was, was chucked out of his church because he exercised discipline on some children of some very well-known members. 23 years of faithful ministry and a, and, and, and a great revival broke out under his ministry and he left the church. But what was interesting was he proved this verse because even though they mistreated him, he said, listen, I, I hear you and I will go, but I want to leave you without a shepherd. So can I just stay here and preach to you until you get a new man? He stayed there for six months with an antagonistic congregation because he was committed to following Jesus Christ. He denied himself, took up his cross, and followed. Rather than retreating through silence and denial of Christ in order to preserve ourselves, we are to take up our cross and follow Jesus to the place of humiliation. And as, we see later, as we'll see later, that humiliation is a path to honor. And so we deny ourselves, self-denial, self-sacrifice, and finally self-surrender and follow me. Uh, I think some translations of the Bible take verse 38, uh, or verse 34, and, and say this, If anyone would follow after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And it seems like a redundant statement. I don't think it's a redundant statement. Jesus is saying, listen, you're all interested. You're interested because you've seen me stand against the authorities. You're interested because you see me do miracles. You've interest, you're, you're interested in me because I have, I, I, I have taught with authority, unlike the scribes. But I, I want you to understand, if you come after me, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross and follow me. He's not just repeating himself. He's saying you must imitate me. In what way? What did Jesus do? He denied himself. He took up his cross. And that's what we are supposed to follow. It's self-surrender. In other words, when we follow Jesus Christ, when we embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are giving up our own right to self-determination. If self-denial means we are abandoning self-promotion, and if taking up a cross means we're abandoning self-preservation, then certainly following Jesus means we're abandoning our self-determination. It's Jesus who now determines our desires, our direction, and our devotion. We follow Him. We surrender to Him in every area of our life. Now, if you're a disciple in the first century and you hear this, and you hear that you have to take up your cross, you hear you're going to be executed if you follow Jesus. If you hear that the one you're following is going to be killed, and you yourself are going to be killed, how would you respond at that point? I would imagine you would think, 
I need to think long and hard about this. Because if this is going to cost me my life, whoa, I better do some proper calculations. And that brings us to my last point this morning, is that the Christian has a mind of Christ and therefore, he has an ongoing, he has a commitment to an ongoing calculation. He's weighing up his decisions in light of eternity. Look at verse 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Look at verse 36. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Verse 37. For what can a man give in return for his soul? Verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus says for, 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 and he's not playing golf. He says, listen guys, I know what I've just said is a hard saying. And if you follow me, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross and you must follow my footsteps, which is going to lead to suffering. But now guys, I want you to do the math. I want you to weigh up what I've just said is going to cost you. And look at the alternative. For what? For whoever will save his life will lose it. For whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. You guys who are right now so concerned about me as Messiah, as King, in conquering the enemies. You who are so, right now, so bent on self-preservation. If you succeed with self-preservation, you're going to lose your soul. But, if you're willing to follow me and even die for me... In the end, you're going to save your soul. You're going to save your life. He builds on that in verse 36 and asks this question, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? An older member of our church, I remember when he came to Christ many years ago, and he said to me, he said, you know, my, my mom taught me a Bible verse when I was young, and it was this verse. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And he said, I could never get away from that. And he came to a point where the, by the grace of God where he started doing the math. I've profited, I've, I've gained the world, but I'm losing my soul. Jesus is saying, be willing to lose the world and have me. What's that? What's that? He sings a, sor- a chorus sometimes. Take the world, but give me Jesus. The Christian is someone who can do the math. They understand the value of a soul. Look at Jesus says in verse 37, for what can a man give in return for his soul? He's saying the soul, the human soul is so precious. The human soul is so valuable and it's going to live forever. You better be very, very careful about your calculations because you're always weighing it up. The world or Jesus? And that's why this, 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 this message of the demands of following Jesus is not just a once-off thing. It's a, it's a daily thing where Paul says, I die daily. Where daily we are denying ourselves, and daily we're taking up our cross and following him. Daily we're, we're tempted by the world. And we have to say, what is most important? I don't want to lose my soul. As somebody said, the apparently gloomy news of the cross is actually the way to total freedom and fulfillment. And only a fool, only a fool would not follow Jesus Christ. I mean, when you look at what Jesus is saying here, He's saying, look look at what's at stake here. If you don't follow me, if you don't deny yourself, if you don't take up your cross, if you don't do that, you're going to lose your soul. I mean, that's a no-brainer, right? But if you don't have the mind of Christ, if you're not thinking God's thoughts, if you're not thinking as God thinks, you're thinking as man thinks, you're going to make the, you're going to make the wrong decision. The other night, the other evening, when I looked into the face 
of a lifeless 17-year-old girl. Several thoughts went through my mind, and one of those that I, I walked home from the house after that, and on the way home I was thinking, wow, death puts things in perspective. Because just that hour before I got a phone call, I was worried about finances, and I was concerned about something else. And once I came face to face, face with a, the reminder of the value of a human life, all of a sudden, those things were thousands of miles away in my mind. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, do the math. Get a right perspective. Understand the value of a human soul. The value of your own soul. One day, every one of us is going to die. Every one of us. You better reckon on that day today. And you better reckon on the fact. Take the world, but give me Jesus. And repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is talking here in a sense about an exchange rate. He said, look at the exchange rate. Look at the exchange of the world compared to the eternal value of a soul. But all this is possible. I think I prayed about this earlier. All this is possible because of the great exchange. Because Jesus Christ, who didn't have to suffer, Jesus Christ, who didn't have to come in the, in the form of a human, Jesus Christ, who didn't have to die on a cross, Jesus Christ, who didn't have to die at all because he was sinless. He says, I'm willing to suffer. And I'm willing to go to a cross and I'm willing to die for those valuable human souls. And he did that for all those who accept what he did, that payment. His redemption price, the ransom price. We know he did that because, as he said here, he's going to rise again, and he did. And because he rose again, we know if we believe on him, the promise of our life being saved, our soul being saved, is certain and sure. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus Christ. I'm not asking if you're religious. I'm not even asking if you're a church member. God knows there are church members who are lost throughout this world. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day. Don't walk away from Jesus. When He comes back, may He not be ashamed of you because you were, because you were born again. And you denied yourself. You took up your cross and you followed him. Your soul is eternally secure. Thank God for our Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your Son. We thank you, Jesus, that you embraced your Father's agenda. You went to the cross. And by the cross, both you and he were glorified. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your ministry of filling Jesus and guiding him through all the steps on earth. We thank you, Triune God, for so great salvation. We just want to pray, Lord, as we close today, for those who hear this message, who are still in their sins, would you please today change that? Give them a new heart to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to be saved, and with that, then a new mind, joyfully denying self, and joyfully taking the cross, and joyfully following you. 
Would you help us as a congregation to daily do the math, to do the calculation of what is most important? And may we be willing to turn our back on the world and receive Jesus afresh and to serve him afresh every day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.